But what we see in today's passage is that God is still at work today. The theme of our series through Mark is that the kingdom of God is near. What does that actually mean? It means the reign of God through Jesus Christ has begun and he will complete it. At the end of the age, everything uh, that is rotten or the influence of Satan will be cleaned out and everything will be perfectly united. There will be total peace and love and all the conflict and all, all the brokenness within our own hearts and souls will be dealt with and resolved. And in the meantime, uh, it is growing. The kingdom of God is growing. We are getting there. God is working things out. And I'm not sure how confident you feel about our IT skills, but how confident do you feel about the kingdom of God, about what I've just been saying, about the fact that God is still working? Is this something that is rock-solid confidence for you? You always feel that, no matter what comes along in life. Or is your confidence in the ongoing work of God, is that a little bit shaky, a little bit up and down, according to the way things go in our lives? And if we look out at our world, well, we see all kinds of trouble, don't we? We see huge problems in the world. We see wars war in Ukraine still going on, the new war in Gaza and all kinds of other wars that don't hit the headlines all the time. And we've got climate change, we've got the polarisation in society and so many big issues today. What have we got to offer? We, we offer a word. A word about a saviour who lived on earth long ago. And does that feel enough? Does that feel tiny sometimes, like just a a mustard seed? Does it feel insignificant, irrelevant, that you'd actually be embarrassed to offer what we have got in face of what's going on in the world? Does it feel like a disappointment? Is it ever a disappointment to you? Do you feel it would be a disappointment to offer the message of Jesus to other people? Jesus himself was no stranger to this. Jesus seemed like a disappointment to the Jews. Now, the Jews were looking forward to Messiah, very much indeed. They were looking forward to the kingdom of God. And what they thought the kingdom of God would be, Messiah would arrive and he would lead a kind of political and military movement. And very soon, there'd be an explosion of power. And all over the world, everything would come straight under the kingdom of God. And the Jews would be top dogs. And they would be the ones enjoying everything. And they wanted that instant kingdom worldwide. And Jesus comes along saying, well, this is what the kingdom of God is like. It is more like a man sowing seeds, growing seeds. He's just told the parable of the sower about the man who sprinkled the seeds. The results are somewhat gradual and patchy. In places, there seems to be no results at all. In places, things spring up for a while, but they don't last long. In places, you get people who are overwhelmed with, if they're poor, they're too obsessed with their worries. If they're rich, they're too obsessed with their luxuries, and they don't really give their heart and attention to the kingdom of God. But there are some, there are some, yes, who become very fruitful for God. 30, 60, 100 times, that's a huge crop. God is going to grow, but it won't be that sudden explosion, and yet he is going to grow it. Now, we too, we would like results, big results, wouldn't we? We have the the same temptations as the Jews of Jesus' time. We'd like to see massive results, the kingdom of God really coming in, an obvious power so everybody uh, could see it, and we could just point and say, look, come on, you've got to believe, or you're you're obviously uh, going cuckoo, aren't you? But it's not like that. So we'd love to have political leaders who are Christians, and every so often uh, people say, oh, so-and-so is just being elected, just wait to see, he will bring in the kingdom of God in such and such a country, and usually that's a great disappointment. The more we pin our hopes on merely human people, the bigger the crash our hopes have to take. Well, what about just 
Just some ordinary Christian celebrities then. Go on, God, can we just see some Christian people uh, who believe the gospel? You know, I mean, when I was young, it was Cliff Richard. We had Cliff Richard, you know, big, well-known pop singer, and he was a Christian. And who have we got now? I mean, there's, there's Justin Bieber. He, he was privately baptised, wasn't he, by Hillsong uh, in the bath at home. Because, because he, he doesn't want to be put on a pedestal. He's not there to speak for Christianity. And let the man work out his own salvation, all right? Let's, let's be glad. But why, why do we want Christian celebrities anyway? Why is it we, we want these kind of big results that everyone can see? Are we, are we insecure in our faith? Is it not enough to know that this eternal word of God came in the flesh as Jesus Christ, gave his life, rose from the dead for us, that he and his apostles have passed on to us the testimony about him. It is archaeologically, historically, absolutely reliable. We we know so much about him, everything that we need to know. Is it not enough? Why Why do we want to hang on to other things? Are we... Are we ashamed because we know this is a post-Christian age? Do we feel, does that really weigh heavy on us as a burden? You know what I mean by that? That This used to be a country that said we are a Christian country and all over uh, the government program and everything we sort of have the the label of doing it in the name of Christ or of the church. Whereas now, I mean to be honest it was always rather shallow, wasn't it? And there was always corrupt crime and selfish exploitation going on all over the place. And now, in a way, you can say, well, it's not good, but at least it's more honest that people are not pretending to be running things in a Christian country. Um, but do we, do we feel embarrassed that we, we've, we've lost? Do we think the kingdom of God is, is over, is not coming anymore? Uh, have, we, have we given up? Because we're in this post-Christian age. Would we only believe if, if we see the Bible on TV? You know, the film club this week looked at a film uh, about uh, America where there was a radio play, Halloween play, uh, about Martians invading. And people were channel hopping and they heard this. And because it was done in the style of a news broadcast, people tuning in thought... This is really happening. The Martians were invading America. And they went out and they could see lights in the sky and they they all thought, oh, the Martians are coming here. And they started shooting things. And it all went a bit wild. The night that panicked America. And we we point and laugh. But have we got the same problem from the other end? Do we think, not just that if it's on telly it must be true, but it can only really be true if it's on telly? Is that why we want to have our God channels and what not? Look, Jesus knew what it was to be not taken seriously. Anyway, if you look at the start of today's passage about this light, does anyone ever bring in a lamp, put it under a bowl or under a bed? Doesn't he put it on a lampstand? What Jesus is saying here is that light is foreseeing. That light is coming into the world. And light is is not for hiding away. Light is to be seen. And it's a big relief if you realise the light he's talking about is not us. It's Jesus himself. Okay, I know elsewhere Jesus says, you are the light of the world. But each time you come across things, even when Jesus says similar things, you have to look at the context. And here, Jesus is talking about himself as the light who has come. So... Thank God it's it's not all about us and our good deeds, eh? Uh, I mean, you know, we're, we're all right. We're, we're, quite, we're quite nice people, really. But we want to have something much more reliable, much some much brighter news to go and tell the world, don't we? Well, we have the news about Jesus. The news about Jesus. Now, all the gospel writers make a lot about Jesus being the light. Now, way back... In Isaiah, it was promised that to us a son would be born. And who would be rejoicing? Galilee of the Gentiles. For the people living in darkness have seen a great light. And on those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. We often read that passage at Christmas about the time when God came in the the flesh. 
And Matthew chapter 4 quotes that from Isaiah chapter 9. But all the Gospels talk about the light in Jesus. When in Luke's Gospel, Simeon takes the baby Jesus in his arms, he says, oh, that's enough for me, Lord. <laughs> you, can, you can make me pop my clogs now. I, I've, I, I've seen enough. I'm so happy to have seen the salvation of the Lord, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles. I've seen this baby. He just, he's just seen a human baby and he says, it's the light for revelation to all the nations of the world. Of course, in John's gospel, he's got this whole theology of light, talking about Jesus, the eternal word, and saying, in him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. That's at the beginning of John chapter 1. So this idea about Jesus being the light, there's a lot more to talk about uh, and a lot brighter light to shine than just us and our good deeds. eh? So when Jesus is talking about lamps not being hidden under beds, he's talking about the, the fact that this light, you've got to take it out. You've got to send it out. It's, it's terrific that it's about Jesus, not about us. It's about what he began and what he began, he will continue. Because at the time, you see, things were a bit hidden. It was like having a, a light hidden under the bed. Uh, we keep on reading things like this, that Jesus would heal people or expel demons and then he would strictly order them not to make him known. You've read that several times already in Mark's Gospel. Because, well, a time is going to come when people do take Jesus to be their king. And that's going to be the triumphal entry to Jerusalem. And within a week of that comes the crucifixion. Big trouble is going to come very quickly as soon as that uh, starts to take on a massive scale. So there's this messianic secret. And even, even what Jesus was saying was somewhat in secret. That's why he used parables. Uh, when Tom explained to us the parable of the sower, it had this bit in the middle of the passage, Mark 4, 11. To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, everything's in parables. Yet memorable stories that people will, will hold on to, but that they won't get the whole thing until later, until it's the right time for you guys, disciples and apostles, to go out explaining it to them. The meaning of the parables was hidden. And so Jesus is the light that is hidden, but he's meant to be made known. Just as he told that parable of the sower about someone going out, and he says the seed that gets scattered, that is the word of God. The seed is meant to grow up. So the word is meant to grow. So the light, this light that's starting off quite small and not visible to everybody, it's meant to shine out, to illuminate the whole house, to go out into the whole town. And also, of course, not only to go out into the world, but the light of Jesus is to light up all the hidden little parts in our life. We just sang a song about shine, Jesus, shine. And there's a light about uh, conquering our darkness, consume all my darkness. You could look at uh, John chapter 3, where John talks a bit more about the light. John 3 from verse 19 He says, this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. Everyone who does wicked things hates the light, does not come to the light, lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes willingly to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. So let us... Use our senses. Let, let's use our senses. We want to see and we want to be seen. We want the light of God to come all the way into our lives and then to start to take that out. And the next thing Jesus says, back in our passage today, about what's hidden is meant to be disclosed. And then he says, if anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. And really in fluent English, we'd say, if your ear's on your head, then you'd better listen. You'd better be listening. You'd better be paying attention. 
And that's what he says next. Consider carefully what you hear. Light is for seeing and ears are for hearing. And he says the measure you use, that's how it'll be measured to you. Uh, how are you coming to Jesus? Are you just bringing a little cup? Okay, can, I have, can I have a verse of the day, please, Jesus? Oh, a little verse. Oh, there's a little treasure in my heart. Uh, well, that's something. That's something too big. I'm not you know, saying it's nothing to give attention to a verse of the Bible at the beginning of each day. But is that all you have time for in the whole day? Or in your daily cycle, do you have time to come with a bigger appetite? To have a bit more of a meal? From Jesus, he said, with the measure you use, that, that's, that's how much you'll be given. If you'd come for just a little bit, that's, that's all you'll receive. Come with an appetite, you'll receive much more. And of course, an appetite, this would be an appetite to learn. Come to God with an appetite to, to hear something new. Prepared to hear something that you haven't understood before. Open the Bible, ready to be challenged. And, of course, ready to actually change, to ask God's help to, to change, to begin a new life, to, to carry on repenting if God points out something. Some light comes into a little corner of your soul, uh, a little nook of your life that actually hasn't really been illuminated wholly by the gospel until now. Yes, Lord, oh, I need to repent about that as well, do I? What about my relationship with... Oh, I see... Yes, Lord, let your light come into my life, even to these little corners as well. Well, I haven't really wanted you to be Lord. I haven't really wanted you reigning until now, but this is your kingdom. Let your kingdom come all the way through me, within me. Jesus is talking about a light and bringing a message that's for our ears to take in because it's meant to go through all the world. But let us start with it coming all the way through all of us. Well, after that, we have these two more short parables about seeds. So from verse 26, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows. Though He doesn't know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain. First the stalk then the head, then the full kernel in the head. A bit like the video that John just showed us of a time lapse of a seed growing. The person who plants the seed doesn't know how this happens. It's God who gives life to the seeds that are planted. And Jesus is saying, look, you don't need to micromanage, you, you don't need to be able to do it. God will do it. God makes the seed grow. The kingdom of God is like this. It's like a seed being planted. Humanly speaking, we can't account for it. God makes it happen. God's going to make that kingdom grow. Yes, it's patchy. Yes, uh, different things happen in different places, but God will see to it. His kingdom will grow. And Jesus, remember, knows what he's talking about when he talks about seeds being buried and giving life. Because Jesus knows that he himself will be buried like a seed is buried in the ground. Uh, Vince referred to this last week when he talked about what Jesus said about him being glorified. This is in John chapter 12, verse 23 and 24. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, then it produces many seeds. Jesus is the one who knows what he's talking about. When he's talking about being buried, Jesus is the one who's going to offer his own life. He has come. We talked about the name, Jesus. What is the name, Jesus? It means God saves, God to the rescue. And he is going to save people by giving himself up to sinful humanity to be nailed onto a cross, to die, to be buried. And then 
on the third day to be raised up to new life by the power of God. And that new power of life, he is now has an unstoppable, immortal, unendable life. And that same power is in you and me. If we too have believed, if we have joined ourselves on to him, if he, he has worked his miracle in us, then it will have no end. Now, this man in the parable who was sowing the seed, he doesn't need to know how it happens. He doesn't even need to do anything more. He just sows the seed. Perhaps he would water it a bit, but that's all he can do. He doesn't need to go and stick on the leaves, does he? Or stick on the little seeds on the top. God gives the growth. As Paul says elsewhere in Corinthians, God gives the growth. So what can the man do? Well, he sleeps, he gets up. Man goes through his natural cycles of life, the daily rhythm. And what's going to happen to the plant? It's the natural cycles. Just like God promised after the the flood, he said that day and night, the seasons, seed time and harvest, these will continue. It's unpredictable in a way that the actual the specific timing nobody knows exactly uh, when the sun's going to shine when the rain's going to come so when the harvest is going to be perfect we know roughly it is going to happen uh, autumnish but the exact crop that we'll receive that's all in the hand of god but god will see to it that it will happen the waves the cycles of life this is not chemistry this is life at work It's a little bit messy and unpredictable, but the cycles of life, they happen. Now, what we see at the moment, post-Christian society, as I said, in Europe, we see the church in Europe, let's be honest, the church on Europe is waning. This church, like most churches, is not as full as it was back in, you know, before Second World War uh, or even since. Um, we, we're going through a lean time. But the church worldwide, the overall number of Christians, uh, people on their way into the everlasting kingdom of God, rising and rising. The global south is taking over and, and probably will be leading uh, the activity and the theology and the evangelism and the mission in the, in the world uh, if, the, if they're not already. Perhaps... We should be glad, like John the Baptist, who when Jesus came said, he must become greater, I must become less. We've got a history of missionary activity and the Baptists have got a a very big contribution in that, uh, of taking the gospel to other parts of the world and how glad we should be that people have received that, taken that seriously and, and are carrying on. Um, even when we are going through a down cycle here in Europe. So, if the church is having a lean time, if numbers are less than they were in Europe at the moment, well, big deal. Let's not be cowed by that. Let's not be mocked by that. Let's not be afraid of what's happening, as if God's lost the plot and forgotten the plan. God is still working his purpose out. God is still growing his kingdom. There are cycles and waves in which he works. I mean, mean, do pray for Europe. I don't mean that I treat it as as a light thing, that so many thousands, millions of people living around us may be on their way to a lost eternity. Let us continue to pray, but let us not fear or lose confidence in the work of God. The kingdom of God is still growing, because this parable ends like this. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it, because the harvest time has come. Yeah, God is going to have a harvest. The language here is pretty much a a quote from uh, another Old Testament prophecy in Joel chapter 3 about God putting in his sickle and having a harvest. This resurrection power that God has set loose in the world, he makes the fruit to ripen, he produces the lives that he is looking for and God is looking forward to saying, enough, let's gather in the harvest and bring my redeemed people into the perfection of the kingdom of God.
yeah, God is going to have a harvest. And so the question for you and me is this, will, will we trust that God does know what he's doing on the way to that harvest day? Will you trust in his plan? His plan for the world, which may include some down phases in this country and, and in other countries that we, we may care about deeply. Will you trust in God? He knows what he's doing in developing and carrying out his plan and pressing on to that harvest day. Will you wait his time? Sometimes we're impatient. We, we think God's timing is all wrong. Why is he taking so long? But it's a time when more people have the opportunity to repent and turn to Jesus. Press ahead. Keep on trusting in God his plan for the world, and his plan for you. Sometimes we we wish we could have the future life now, the future life when we have bodies that are immortal. There'll be no more crying or suffering or pain. But in this age, those things are with us. We look for the time to come when they'll be over. Will you trust in God as he works out his plan in your life? God's harvest is coming. And the last little parable, it's like a mustard seed. The kingdom of God is also like a mustard seed, one of the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. Well, when Jesus says the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, it's not like the mustard seed that we saw in the video. Uh, A mustard seed, as we say, it starts tiny. And in that sense, the kingdom of God is like the mustard seed. It starts tiny. And that's what Jesus is saying. Look, at the moment, it's just me and you few guys getting it up here in Galilee and in the wild, remote parts of northern Israel. It's tiny, but it'll grow huge. It'll grow and grow. And it'll, it'll start to take over the world. It'll be huge. And this kingdom of God, it starts like a mustard seed, but it grows like something else. It's no longer like a mustard seed. Mustard seed can grow into a reasonable sized bush, but Jesus talks about a, a fantastic, huge, astonishing tree, bigger than anything in the catalogues or the encyclopedias. It's the biggest tree you've ever heard of. And it, it's astonishing. It's, it's wonderful. It's indestructible. Um, any fans here of the Avatar films? Uh, you know, with the, the, those blue people, uh, and they live in this tree house. That, well, their city, is, they, they call it Home Tree. I mean, it's, it's enormous. It's, it's really wonderful. But that tree does get cut down. The kingdom of God can never be cut down. It's better than that. But it's indestructible. God's kingdom grows and grows and grows. It's unstoppable. You know, in the middle of last century, uh, in China, uh, various missionary organizations had been finding it increasingly difficult to carry on in China. And then come 1949, when the communists took power, uh, even the China Inland Mission, that was, I think, the last mission that said, okay, we've got to just shut up shop. We need to, to go. We can't stay anymore. There, there's no way to carry on. And the missionary writer, Phyllis Thompson, wrote a book about that called The Reluctant Exodus, how they had to leave China. And for 50 years, people had no idea. Well, through the time of Chairman Mao and the Cultural Revolution, and all kinds of intellectuals were, were being silenced or, or done away with. What on earth would be happening to the church? That million people or so that had been left there, that had turned to Christ, how would they be getting on without any outside help whatsoever? No contact with the church and the rest of the world, just uh, a few copies of the Bible among them. What would be happening with nothing but the Bible and that, you know, the Holy Spirit? Well... <laughs> After 50 years, when people finally were able to make contact again, they found millions, what, 20 million officially, 
unofficially probably 40 or 60 million uh, people. Uh, the church grew and grew through those horrific times of persecution and poverty and loss and sadness. The church thrived. God is able to grow his church, even through the most unpromising situations and episodes. And God's kingdom is home to diverse multitudes. It becomes the biggest of all the plants with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. Well, that's a reference back to the language uh, in Daniel and Ezekiel uh, about the nations being gathered and finding shelter under some huge kingdom, sometimes under Nebuchadnezzar or under Assyria. Uh, This is Ezekiel 31. Once a cedar in Lebanon with beautiful branches overshadowing the forest, all the birds of the sky nested in its boughs. All the great nations lived in its shade. So this picture about the kingdom of God being like this mustard seed growing into the vast tree and all the birds perching in its shade. It's talking about all people of all nations. Oh, it's not just for the Jews anymore. Indeed, uh, here we are, a diversity of people, and yet there are uh, many nations who, not many, are coming to Christ at the moment. But the church, the doors are open. Let everyone be welcome here. So Jesus has told us, about the kingdom of God advancing and growing. Light that can never be extinguished. A word that is really worth listening to. Seed that grows and grows and is unstoppable by the same resurrection power of God that raised Jesus from the dead. He will see it through. So a question, will will you let the light in? Will you let this wonderful light of God into any little corners, parts of your life that you've been kind of keep trying to keep hidden from God? Because whatever's hidden will be revealed. And will you shine on this light, this light that cannot be extinguished, this light of Jesus, the long-promised saviour of the world? If, if we all said, yes, if we all said yes, then it, each of us would be wholly transformed, made like Jesus Christ, made the more similar to what we will be gloriously in eternity, trans, transform now our, our lives, ripe fruit for God to look forward to his harvest and say, oh, here is one. I gather to myself how this person is perfectly in my image already. And we're, we become a church together where people of all nations will find light, will find this life of God that is inextinguishable, inexhaustible. And they would find a loving welcome here. Shall we finish with a, a brief prayer that God would do that work among us? Or perhaps we should confess that we, we do lose confidence a bit. We, we're so easily uh, awed by the bigness of the problems in the world and the criticisms uh, and the way people belittle uh, religion or trust in you. But Lord, we look to you, the everlasting light, the light shining in the dark. Thank you that you have life that can never be put out and you are giving this life. You are growing this life among your people all over the world. Lord, we pray for bigger days for the kingdom of God in the UK and in all of Europe and in North Africa and wherever else. Uh, that The harvest seems very slight at the moment, but we trust ourselves to you. And we pray you would give us confidence so that we will let you shine your light into every part of our lives and that in your grace you would use us to shine your light on to our neighbours and other people around us. For Jesus' glory. Amen.